um, um, thanks, Sophia, for the kind introduction. Uh, and uh, let me just begin by extending my greetings of peace uh, and solidarity to all our speakers, uh, as well as friends who are watching this program, uh, who are part of this program uh, in different parts of uh, Southeast Asia. Um, my name is Charles Santiago, as introduced, and I'm the chairperson of the ASEAN Parliamentarians for Human Rights at this time. Um, I've been asked to speak on two sets of questions. Uh, well, the first question is, what are the major needs of the ASEAN people today? ASEAN people today? And then uh, the second question is, uh, how do we redesign ASEAN uh, in terms of uh, people's voices? How do we redesign them? So I think uh, to answer the first question, uh, I think one of the biggest uh, issues facing uh, ASEAN today, uh, the people of ASEAN today, uh, is the economic inequality in our society. In all our countries, in all our 10 countries, we have a major problem of uh, inequality, uh, something that has been brought into sharp focus by the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and the subsequent economic recession. For a start, the pandemic has had a disproportionate impact on vulnerable groups. In fact, one can say, and let's be clear, that one of the uh, communities that are worst affected are the poor, uh, and especially people in the informal sector uh, and small businesses. These are people who have been affected quite horribly uh, by the pandemic. Um, and also, uh, notably, uh, refugees and migrants, as well as workers in the informal economy. Many of these people have been pushed deeper into poverty as a result and unemployment by the health crisis. For example, in Thailand, in my own country, Malaysia, migrants have been uh, disproportionately affected uh, with widespread infections found among migrant workers, um, uh, worker communities, due to overcrowded uh, and high, unhygienic living conditions uh, that have increased the risk of COVID-19 spreading. Uh, in fact, uh, refugees as well as migrants uh, in detention centers uh, also face a similar problem of um, uh, unhygienic uh, um, uh, migrant condi uh, uh, detention conditions. In addition, migrant workers lose their jobs or incomes. Some are facing shortages of food and clean drinking water, not to mention discriminatory obstacles in receiving medical treatment and assistance from governments. But this you can also extend to local people as well, where in the case of Malaysia, we have uh, thousands of families today, even till today, who are having difficulty putting food on the table, having difficulty putting food on the table as a result of loss of jobs, loss of income, uh, and uh, there's no nothing, no promise of any support for them by the government. In some countries, including my own country, Malaysia, governments have used the pandemic as an excuse to scapegoat refugees and migrants as part of efforts to distract from their own failings in effectively tackling the pandemic. Uh, this inequality we are witnessing in our region is also heavily linked to one of the most pressing issues of our time, both uh, in Southeast Asia and globally. Uh, the climate crisis. Uh, this is a second issue that I think faces a lot of us in Southeast Asia. And Southeast Asia is regarded as one of the world's most risk regions. I mean, this is uh, risk regions by the United Nations from the impact of climate change. And time is quickly running out for drastic action to be taken that will reverse the cause. It's certainly something that the people of the region have recognized as a priority. Although COVID-19 has dominated much of the public discussion and discourse for the past year or so, uh, most people in South Asia view COVID-19 and the climate crisis as of equal priority. Though. So this is something that both we have to keep as activists. We have to keep in mind that the uh, climate crisis and the COVID crisis should be seen in terms of equal priority uh, for governments and also for the work that we do. That's according to a study published late last year by IICA out of Singapore. According to the study, climate change is viewed as a current crisis by much of ASEAN's population. Respondents to the study said the national governments, followed by individuals and businesses and industry, should be those most responsible for tackling climate change. There was also, there was also a high level of engagement on climate-related uh, advocacy, particularly from youths in Southeast Asia, indicating a passion to tackle the issues. The study found that more than 50% uh, of respondents, uh, youth under the age of 21, are involved in leading a project mobilizing support or attending environment, environment or environmentally related uh, seminars. This is something that you can see uh, that, uh, you know, uh, going forward. The leaders of our region have also recognized the importance of tackling environmental issues 
and in their own ASEAN comprehensive recovery framework, Southeast Asia governments recognize that climate change represents a fundamental risk to ASEAN and that actions to mitigate the impacts of climate change should be taken urgently and immediately. This is an issue that has attracted considerable attention, particularly as part of efforts to keep global temperature below 1.5 degrees Celsius and ahead of the Global Climate Change Conference COP26, which will begin in Scotland in late October. In fact, the ASEAN Parliamentarians for Human Rights, uh, this is something that we've been looking closely at, and this afternoon we'll release a report, Building Back Better, looking at how countries in Southeast Asia can shift towards a greener economy, shift towards a greener economy after COVID-19. We must do everything we can to introduce policies and measures that breaks away from problematic practices of the past and move towards a just and sustainable economy and one that protects our rights and creates equal opportunities for all. As representatives of the people, us lawmakers lie at the heart of fulfilling climate change commitments, whether that's through our role in pushing progressive legislation, overseeing the national budget, or in our mandate to voice our constituents who will be the most affected by climate change if no action is taken. Earlier this year, I was also heavily involved in the launch of the parliamentarian's call for a fossil fuel free future, a fossil fuel free future, a global project that is calling for MPs to contribute to efforts towards a transition away from coal, oil, and gas. Move away from coal, oil, and gas. The reason myself and my fellow colleagues feel so passionately about this topic is because time is running out to act. The scientific consensus is clear that human activities are the main cause of climate change, which is one of the gravest threats to the natural environment, human rights, and peace. The effects of climate change are being felt every day and have already left to devastating consequences on people's lives. Not only do they exacerbate the spread of disease, but also threaten societal issues, serious, serious issues such as food security and key infrastructure, and if left unchecked, will push millions more people into poverty, hunger, and displacement. Our leaders in the region have so far failed on the issues of inequality and climate change, not to mention other crucial, crucial issues impacting our region. One of those that is clearly on the rise is authoritarianism, uh, in the region, where countries including Cambodia, the Philippines, Thailand, and Myanmar have all witnessed worrying backslides in terms of democratic freedoms in recent years. Many of these oppressive governments have in fact used COVID-19 pandemic to introduce harsher, harsher measures that restrict people, people's fundamental rights, such as freedom of assembly or speech. It is elsewhere in the region, particularly ASEAN, as a bloc, have shown themselves essentially useless in terms of pushing back against the disporting trends. I think a good example of that is what's happening in Myanmar. I've said it before, and I'll say it again, that ASEAN is today little more than a rich man's club. Let me say that again, though. A little more than a rich man's club. And it's already poor, and its already poor reputation has taken a further blow this year uh, with an inability to act on the crisis taking place in Myanmar. ASEAN failed to stand on the side of Myanmar people when they needed them most. But when this region lacks in terms of leadership from our governments, it, it more than makes up for the strength of civil society groups such as ours that, uh, who are part of this program. And we must do everything in our power to uplift the voices who are working for advancement and improvements in our societies. This includes doing everything we can to bring different voices together and learn from each other as well as being inclusive as possible in our efforts to ensure that as many people, different perspectives as possible are heard, particularly those from groups who are over, often sidelined in discussions. Now, to answer the second question, and I'll answer some of the second part of the second question, uh, which was, what, how do you redesign uh, uh, ASEAN from a people's standpoint? How do you uh, redesign? I think this, we go back to the ASEAN Charter. The ASEAN Charter is quite clear with, to its commitment to rule of law, its commitment to human rights, to its commitment on democracy, uh, as well as good governance. Uh, it is clear that none of the countries in the region, except maybe one uh, or two, um, um, 
try as much as possible to fulfill all of the four, rule of law, good governance, human rights, and democracy. Uh, and I think this is where we are lacking. So if we want to redesign uh, uh, ASEAN, we should look at one, to, to, up, to up, upgrade, upgrade uh, in, the levels of, in the level of priority of human rights and democracy, good governance, and rule of law. I think these are some things that we really have to keep in mind, besides the idea that uh, climate change is also quite important in the way we live. ASEAN governments are very quiet, in fact, uh, play a very uh, limited role in their own countries in terms, in terms of addressing climate crisis. Even, even, after the, uh, even after the UN's warning that Southeast Asia is a spotlight, it could be you know, uh, uh, in, in, in the receiving end of climate change, but nothing much is being done at, the, at a serious level. Now, I also would like to say that another uh, development that we see happening in the region, especially with the COVID crisis, is lack of social protection for ordinary people, both in the, in the formal sector as well as in the informal sector. Governments, for the most part, are focusing on the formal sector, but we have to look at the informal sector as part of uh, 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 rolling out um, um, uh, social protection for people. Now, this is quite important. Because sometimes the informal sector, in the case of Malaysia, it's about 4.9 million people. And right now they have no support. The formal sector does not get any support. Most of the support goes to the formal sector. Even, even that is not very much, but still there is some support for the formal sector, but not for the informal sector. And I'm sure that is what you see in other countries as well, especially uh, in the less developing countries. So I think we need uh, you know, some, some kind of a, uh, a worker security, uh, insurance security for uh, informal sector workers and for in those countries where there is no uh, social security for uh, or, 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 or uh, workers insurance security we need to put that uh, for uh, we need to keep that um, in mind as we go forward I think these are th some of the things that we need to keep in mind uh, because at the end of the day it's, as, it, as it seems right now most of the region it, the un unemployment is quite high uh, people are finding it difficult to put food on the table, as I mentioned earlier. So governments have to step up. Governments have to step up uh, and actually rethink their role in government, rethink about their commitment to human rights, especially one that they signed in the ASEAN context. Most of them in all of ASEAN have nice, have got very nice documents that they have signed in the ASEAN level. But when it comes to implementation in their own countries, it is really, really behind. It's really, really behind uh, and, uh, and uh, and it's completely undemocratic and human rights is thrown to the garbage bin. So I think the work that we have to do is much, but I'd like to say that in redesigning, in looking forward, I think some of the things that we have to look at is the issue of rule of law, human rights, good governance, democracy, uh, which are already in ASEAN Charter. Uh, I think we need to push governments to honor what they have already signed. I think that's one. And then to look at the issue of climate change. The other issue is the issue of uh, social protection, for both formal workers and also informal sector. I think this is the way forward. Ideas such as uh, job guarantees can be put forward. Uh, ideas uh, such as uh, sub, uh, insurance scheme for informal sector workers should also be considered as part of redesigning ASEAN, relooking at ASEAN uh, going forward. I will stop here. I'm sorry, I have to leave after this uh, because uh, I need to go back to the chamber for a debate uh, and uh, that starts at 2.30. So, Sophia, I really apologize and apologize to other friends. I can't join you for the Q&A, but, uh, but thanks for the kind invitation. And I hope to catch up with you folks at some point in time. Thank you very much. And thank you. Thank bye -bye. you, Sam.